This podcast is sponsored by Apprento. Apprento is a sales acceleration platform that grows your sales by growing your sales people. Apprento does this in two ways. Firstly, by accelerating existing sales team's performance. And secondly, by sourcing and developing those with potential. To grow your sales, reach out to Apprento at apprento.io forward slash call. Welcome to the Rev Up Podcast, where we, Alex and Scotty, talk to interesting people from all walks of life and apply their insights to the world of business to business selling. Tune in to explore new sales tactics to better understand people and to rev up your performance. These are uncertain times. Inbound leads are drying up. Deals are taking longer and finding or retaining high-performing sales teams is harder than ever. We put together the practical advice we share with our top clients in a short to the point ebook. Visit apprento.io forward slash download to get your free ebook right away. How are you? Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, not bad. Not been out much recently, but yeah, not too bad. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny that, Um, same here. Look, really appreciate you giving up some time to have a chat to me today. Um, so for those who don't know Richard, uh, he is the founder of Pure SEO. Tell us a little bit about your story and of how you came to be doing what you're doing today. Cool. All right, Pure SEO started in October 2009, shortly after um, reached New Zealand from the UK. Came over here all arrogant, thinking I'll roll into a job and uh, no one wanted to give me a job, no Kiwi experience. Uh, so I thought, bugger it, create my own job. Um, so Pure SEO was started in my living room with 200 bucks. Kind of built it from there. We now be by far the largest in our niche. We've got about 70 people across four countries. Um, and we specialize in search engine optimization, search engine marketing, Google ads, um, programmatic, social, and just the digital marketing kind of um field Mm. and i think one of the reasons i want to talk to you today is because you've done a phenomenal job of building out a a really high performing sales team um Mm. and wanted to kind of pick your brain um on what are some of the principles you've um put in place to keep performance because i think what a lot of companies struggle with is that you know their first sales highs will perform but it's hard to maintain that performance the bigger the team gets um so yeah tell me what are some of the key things that you think have led to your team's success so first it's it's actually not me it's not my um it's not my skill set that enabled that so going back um we had my first sales guy still with me and it was brilliant but that was luck of the draw (laughs) Um, then we went through a period of years where we're getting what we perceived to be good salespeople and they were all failing. Uh, they were all not hitting targets and, um, dissent and things like that. And I just thought our recruitment process was wrong. We then, um, I then did a presentation about this in my EO forum. And what I then decided to do was find a really good sales manager. And so I asked around and three names came up. And so I tapped each three of them on the shoulder uh, and got them to come in for interviews. Um, We employed one of those three um, Mm. as my general manager now. And it turned out that it wasn't crap salespeople we had. It was rubbish systems and processes. We weren't allowing them to, um, to succeed. I think for a salesperson, they need those systems and processes because everything's repeatable so for example cold calls they know how many cold calls they need to make to arrange a meeting you know the really good sales people when they get a no they think they're one closer to getting a yes so they know it all averages out and how they get that cold call you know they pick up the phone they do a bit work beforehand they identify a good prospect and then they look on page two of google you're on page two of google um your competitors on page one look give us half an hour i'll explain why they're on page one and you're on page two Uh, let's grab a coffee why wouldn't you then once you're in front of people then um yeah 
they're likely to have stand a good chance of closing the deal mm. and then have the view that even if you don't win the business, go into that sales meeting with the idea that that other person will come out of it thinking I'd have paid a couple hundred bucks for that. I've got so much value out of that. Cause if you don't even get the deal, they're going to have a positive impression of you and they're going to tell other people. So mm. provide value. Um, don't be ultra salesy, provide value, 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 and a solution to what their particular need is. And then it's all, all around process. You know, how many, to- how many cold calls, how many, uh, have you chased up? Have you asked for the deal? You know, a lot of people do work and then they don't even ask for the deal. Um, yeah. You know, simple things like calling people back. There are so many companies you put an inquiry in and then nobody gets back to you. You know, I want to, I want to spend my money with you, but yeah, you know, you're not phoning me back. So getting the basics right and putting in a good process. And I'd love to take uh, credit for that, but yeah, there's <laughs> people I brought in that um, actually put those in place. Yeah. I think if you've touched on, a few really important things there that I see earlier stage companies get wrong all the time is they, they first look to hire that unicorn salesperson. Now it sounds like you were lucky and actually did find a unicorn salesperson, but they are unicorns. Yeah. Um, and if you try to do that again, you probably wouldn't. If you try to do it three times, you probably maybe if you're lucky, you get it once. Yeah. Um, and I think what you said there around process being the ultimate in terms of why, the difference between a successful team and an unsuccessful team. I think that's really, really important. So what does that look like for you? What are the, some of the systems and tools and processes that, that you have in the business that enables that at scale? So um, I think there's there's an important thing first is around remuneration and around how they're incentivized. So we pay quite a high base. We pay uh, for a car, we pay a phone, we pay petrol, but we don't pay too high a base that they become lazy because they don't need anything. And we pay really high commission and we uncap the commission. You know, the guys can earn several hundred grand a year if they're successful. Now, I never understand why people cap commission. Like, it just doesn't make sense. So I want my sales guys to have the biggest checks because that means they're doing the biggest deals. Mm. Um, In terms of systems and processes, we were using high-rise. We've just moved over to Excello. Um, the reason being is Excello for us is a more holistic product, mm. which um, encompasses the whole organization. That being said, we've moved over it. It's been a few months, but we only moved over it in the last few weeks. So it's very gotcha. new. But High Rise was what we were using before. And it measures, you know, they can have an app. It measures when to call back, how many touch points, how likely you are to yeah. close the deal and all, all that kind of stuff. It also, we've got quite a large sales team now. We've got 15 people someone puts it in high rise or now Accelo, no one else can go after that mm. uh, person. However, if it's been in there for a certain period of time and there's been no contact, then it's fair game. Um, and so I think having the rules that are crystal clear across the board, um, negate any of the problems. Cause you know, someone comes in, they sign a deal. Oh, well, I had that in high rise. Well, you hadn't contacted them six months. It's my deal. Fair enough. That's the rule. Or, that I contacted them three weeks ago and you've just come in and closed the deal. Well, that's not your deal because it's their client. So having those black and white, I think keep away um, a lot of the f- tension that could go um, wrong in and things like that. Mm, I agree with you on the commission plan situation in terms of remuneration. There are definitely that I, I see no benefit whatsoever to capping commissions. I think it's it's a it's a fool's game because if your salespeople are not incentivized to keep earning, then you're not going to be earning as a business because they're going to stop selling. Um, so I 100% agree with you there. And I also like how you've couched it there. It's like you pay them a good base salary so they you know they've got enough, but not enough that they're comfortable because you want your salespeople, especially new business focused salespeople, you want them to be you want them to be pushing and earning big commissions. It shouldn't be that their base salary is 80% of their earnings. It should be like 50, 50 or 60, 40, or even in some cases I've seen organizations pay super low base, but have their reps earning three, 400 grand a year with a base salary of 60 grand. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think in, in principle, I think some of the things you said, there are great. And then equally from a visibility and a rules perspective in terms of how you manage the team, I think that's really important. So you don't have infighting within your team 
um, because that can turn toxic very quickly. When you with do you have a very good view in terms of the numbers and like percentages? Like you know, you talked about how many calls you need to make to get a meeting. Do you have that right the way through your pipeline? And if so, what are some of those key things you track? We track phone calls to meetings, um, meetings to presentations, presentations to um, sign deals, and all everything mm. in between. Mm. Um, it's my sales manager and then the or the, the two sales managers and then the GM uh, that focus on that. I just get presented in the board report once a month, the sort of salient figures. Uh, but a, an important thing, I think, more than anything, uh, learned a number of years ago that you know, it's natural to try and want to make the worst salespeople better. And by doing so, you negate the better salespeople. They're, dis they're disadvantaged by the fact that you're spending loads of time on the ones that aren't performing. Yeah. In my view, you've got to look at it like a sports team. Um and put your main focus on the people who are doing well and get better and better and better rather than spend all your time and um, disadvantage people who are doing really well. Um, it was a, what's his name? It was an American sales, um, sales guy that um, taught me that. But it's brilliant because you're naturally, you naturally want to help the people who aren't succeeding so well. Yeah. Um, that's human nature. But you look at a high performing team, right? the manager focuses on the best players and gets the best out of them. And why is a business any different? Mm, it's a good point. Because I think from, from coaching quite a few sales leaders, one of the things they often say, and, I, and I've heard this consistently, is that a lot of our time is spent working with the underperformers and trying to bring them up. Yeah. And then a frustration often from a business perspective and from a rep's perspective, which you've just called out there, is that the top performers or, or middle of the road performers even are not getting the support and coaching they need to be even better. So you're actually missing out on a lot of growth potential by focusing all your effort on that one person or a couple of people who are effectively underperforming. And, and, and actually sometimes um, you can't help them. Like sometimes the underperformers, there's actually nothing you can do. They're just wrong for your business. It might not even be that they're a bad salesperson. It's just they're wrong for the product that you're selling yeah. for your business. Um, so where does values, you know, what, where do values come into this in terms of, do, do, do you have like uh, organizational values or sales team values that, that roll into this? Yeah, we do have, we do have our, um, our company wide values. Um, it, it all stems from the overarching thing, which is doing digital the right way. Mm. Um, our, our sort of core values are trust, respect, integrity, and family. But there's there's quite a bit underneath that. But ultimately, it's all about um, doing what's right, doing what's right for the customer, doing what's right um, for the business. I have these two two things that everyone in the business knows. One, if you do it, and it was then on the front page of the Herald, would you be comfortable with it? Hmm. If it's not, don't do it. And the other thing is, if you treat someone in a certain way and you wouldn't be comfortable being treated that way yourself, don't do it. Simple. Treat people the way you want to be treated yourself. Um, and we, we also have, like our sales guys are incentivized to sell, but we've got the GM looks at every single deal that comes in. And if he doesn't believe that we're going to be able to help them or we're going to be able to give them a return on investment, he will turn down the sale. Right. Turn around. And, and the guys know that, and they know that they shouldn't bring in, because we're not for everybody. You know, you're selling a, you know, a couple of dollar product. It's going to take years and years or mass volume in order to get it back from SEO, SEM, programmatic. It might not be the right channel for you in the first instance. So mm. um, we really don't want to... Um, we don't want to take on the wrong customers. Uh, that being said, you've got the other side of things. You know, we also expect to be treated in a certain way uh, by customers. I mean, I had one customer recently uh, who they paused during the first COVID uh, and we let them pause for a long time. They were in the um, jewelry business 
and they were still spending money on Google ads. Um, and so after about seven, eight months, I said, look, you're, you're the last company to have come back. Who hasn't left? And I met the guy face to face and he shook my hand and said, yeah, we'll come out, we'll see the end of the contract. And then two months later, he's asking for another pause. <laughs> and it just like, you know, I shake someone's hand and say something. And that really like, that's not a pure client because I don't think that's ethical. I don't think that's the right kind of people that we want to work with. Want to know the DNA of your top sales performer? Reach out to us at apprento.io forward slash call for a complimentary sales DNA assessment of up to three of your salespeople. Find out the specific capabilities that lead to success in your environment using our sales DNA assessment platform, as well as uncover potential capability gaps to inform your team's development. Had a big old client paying us five, com- five grand a month in early doors, and they were so rude to my staff, effing and blinding and telling them to come straight over to their office. And just thought, you know, it's just not worth it. It's, no. it's not worth So we fired them, I think. Uh, you need to live your values, yeah, and they need to come from the top. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a, it's, it's it's cool how you've got some values there that you can really picture. I particularly like the NZ Herald one. You know, like if it, you know, would you be comfortable with this on the Herald? I think that's really cool because it, you know, that's something that sticks in your mind, and you can, you would live that every day. You know, you wouldn't want, uh, you know, that's a really good reminder. Um, what about? sales success do you celebrate it as an organization oh yeah we're always celebrating sales success um you know it's it's up on the board all the um all the sales of the month etc um new sales guys come in their first deal gets a massive clap around there's there's a bit of competition cool um the sales team got so big that we split it into two um and the two uh, sales managers got to pick their own teams Hmm. Um, and now they compete against each other. Um, both the sales managers have been with us for a number of years. They're both top salespeople and they're still salespeople, but they're just nurturing and training the others. Um, and that's something that's actually really good in our organization is how the salespeople go out their way to help the other ones. Hmm. Um, it's, yeah, they're hunters though. They're all hunters in our business. They need to be able to generate their own leads. We get two or three inbound leads a day to our mm-hmm. business. Not at the moment, not during lockdown, um, but they still need to go out. They need to cold call. They need to lock on doors. They need to network. They need to hustle. They need to constantly be looking and generating their own business. And um, they hit their target. They get they get really good commission. I mean, they get really, really, really strong commission. For example, someone signs a 10K a month deal, they'll get 10 grand commission there and then yeah. you know, in month one. So get a nice 10 grand check on top of their base, on top of everything else. Um, so they're incentivized to sign the, the 12 month decent mm. deals. It's cool how you celebrate sales success as a, as a, as a wider organization. And I particularly like what you've just said there about for your very first deal, there's a bit of a song and a dance. I think that's quite cool to kind of bring, bring new reps into the fold um and make them feel you know loved and, and and that success celebrated one of the things we often see is that i think particularly in the startup space where things are often very much product led companies um that sales success isn't celebrated and it's often a bit of an afterthought um and then those companies then kind of wonder why their sales don't grow as quickly perhaps as they'd like um what would your kind of message or lesson be or, you know, two companies who are just starting out, you know, in terms of creating that kind of sales culture, which by the sounds of you've built a brilliant sales culture within the organization, what, what would your kind of recommendations be there? So I, I think every business is a sales and marketing business. It doesn't matter what your product you have, what service you have, sales and marketing are what's going to make the business a success, right? Mm. If you've got the most incredible product and nobody knows about it, you know, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, and so I think any business, their core focus needs to be getting those sales and getting that marketing on pat. Like if you don't do that, it's very hard to, um, to scale a business. Like in the early doors, it was just me. And I can go out and I can sell stuff because I've got passion for it. And you know, I'm going to be believable because I believe it myself. And so 
if, if I believe it, I'm going to be able to convince someone else it's true. But no one else is going to have that passion that you have because they're not you know, all invested. And so how do you find that person who can sell your product in the right way? Because our product has to be sold in a certain way um, and understands the limitations and things like that. And I think what you need to do is you need to find, firstly, people who are hunters, but also culturally the right kind of people. I mean, we've had a few bad eggs in the past and you know, their deals invariably fall over because they do anything to get them across the line and they're just not right for the business. It just creates noise. Mm -hmm. You want the um, salespeople who genuinely care about their customers' businesses, the clients they bring on, and they really want them to succeed and they really know the limitations of the product and that they want to stay in touch with these people and they want to um, hear the successes because – you know, that's where all the all the fun gets. And then then they utilize that to generate more leads because you've done well for someone, you've stayed in touch. You know, why wouldn't they recommend you? Mm. And it are really successful salespeople are hunters and relationship builders. Uh, but another interesting thing is we've had salespeople who've come in and at the beginning they've really struggled, right? Mm. And the ones that succeed that struggle are the ones that are sitting there at home doing proposals in the evening, working really hard and then banging on the phones during the next day. And they may not be natural salespeople, but they're grafters and they will often outperform the natural salespeople just by following process and grafting. Mm -hmm. you know, the natural salespeople will get a couple of deals and get a bit lazy again and, you know, and so on and so forth. They'll always be there or thereabout, but they often won't be top of the board because the grafters end up being the top of the board, the ones who are really just working it, just constant, constant work. And it's not complicated. Um, it's just following a process and working hard. Yeah, there was, a, there was an interesting book written about this. Um, and I've, as I've said that, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's basically about introverts actually often make the best salespeople, not the typical extrovert that you'd imagine, because they're more diligent to a process. And, you know, your extrovert might have an amazing month, but then the next month when their mood's not so good, it might dip down or if they get a yeah. bit lazy, like you said, whereas, in, you know, your, your process-driven introvert will just follow the process and be methodical and in the long run will outperform, um, which is often the case, which is actually um, not what the kind of popular uh, belief is out there, is that, you know, most people think your salespeople are your relationship uh driven loud extroverted types and they can be but not always um i also think um a lot of people especially in new zealand are anti cold calling cold calling doesn't work yeah it's rubbish cold calling does work but you have to think about the way you cold call you can't just pick up the phone is is bob there yeah can we meet up um i've got something you might be really interested in you have to create that need you have to find out something and you have to offer value you offer value and you go in there without a sale. You just go in there and provide value. And if that eventually leads to something else, all good. But if you've provided that value, then that cold call has been worthwhile. And so it's thinking about how to provide that value on the cold call or what, what value you're giving. It's mm. not about just picking up the phone and just churning through the phone. And the better you get at it, you see like, you know, I think it's, it's sort of average sort of one to 10 is for a meeting, but you know, some of them have gotten down to one to three, four calls because mm. they just know the pattern. They know to identify the right companies who are going to benefit from it. And they know the figures, they know that they've done a bit of research beforehand. And so they're not phoning up cold and they're targeting verticals that work. And so cold calling does work and it needs to be for certainly for us, one of our, um, strings you know obviously you know we spend five six grand a month on google ads bringing in leads mm. we're top for seo i do a lot of speaking gigs we do our own marketing so there's all these things we've got like 25 30 branded cars on the road so we've got all these different things which build the brand which give credibility because invariably mm. you know you phone up uh, love to chat with you have you heard of pure seo oh you have and then it's thing it's not like with some company they've never heard of and it's all about that separate brand building on the side. Mm. But even on, even with all of that, you still get a large chunk of deals 
coming from cold calls. Oh, yeah. Um, which I think if there's one thing that companies take away from this conversation, there's been a lot of things for people to take away, but there's one thing to take away. It's, it's that, is that for even an organization who's spending a lot of money on ads, has a good brand, you've got a founder who's out there and who's known and you've got great brand awareness, you're still doing cold calling um, to grow. And, um, you know, for any of the naysayers out there who don't think cold calling works, um, well, I think really they're just missing out. They're missing out on pretty significant business. Um, yeah. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it, you know? That's right. And, and I think to like when I first started getting advisory work, I probably did about a thousand outreaches to get my first hundred clients, something yep. like that. Um, maybe a bit more. And it's, um, it, like you said, if it was easy, everyone would have, you know, more clients than they knew what to do with. Um, and I think actually just on that, even companies like HubSpot and Salesforce, who have probably the most sophisticated marketing engines ever, even their teams are probably doing about 20 to 30% of their deals are coming from cold calling, from, from cold outreach, yeah. uh, sometimes more in, in certain teams. So um, last question for you, Richard, if you knew everything you knew now when you were starting your business, from a you know with a sales lens what what would you have done differently loads of things <laughs> pick two, <laughs> two two or three <laughs> i wouldn't have wasted those hundreds of thousands of dollars on sales people that didn't have the process okay. like we were setting them up for failure they were coming in it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars i, I wasted there um, the other thing, which is less sales focused, more company focused, is I thought too small when I started the business. I had the .co.nz. I should have thought global from day, day one. Why couldn't we be a global business? Okay. Yeah, and that was a real mistake. And it cost me only $4,000 to buy the .com a couple of years ago. Yeah, Within months of getting it, we had deals coming in from Hong Kong and stuff. Hmm. Like, I should have done that at the beginning, but you don't know what you don't know. Mm. It's great. Thank you so much. And um, where can people find you if they want to connect with you or, or follow some of your content or anything like that? Cool. We've got a blog um, at pureseo.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my email is richard at pureseo.co.nz. Drop me an email. Follow me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty relaxed. Uh, you know, yeah, same, same. Brilliant. Hey, look, really appreciate your time today, mate. And there's been some great insights there for, um, you know, business owners, sales leaders and, and, and reps. Um, cool. Thanks for having me. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Rev Up Sales Podcast. Subscribe to have the latest episodes downloaded to your device and share us with your colleagues and friends. Be sure to download the free ebook that will help you sell successfully in uncertain times. You can schedule a call with Alex or me, Scotty, at apprento.io forward slash call.